All right, so here's where your ISM page goes. It's going on page 21. It's hot a little notes, and it says topic 1-1. So these numbers right here go along with the same content, and I'm pretty sure the same title in AP Classroom. So in AP Classroom, I will be assigning some questions so that they're literally the AP styles. Um, but you also can go in there into AP Classroom and um, access things that I don't assign, meaning like there's videos that reteach this topic and there's videos that, you know, that maybe you want to watch if you feel like you need to. Uh, you don't have to do anything that I don't assign, but that's how that works, okay? So this is called change in tandem. So in, uh, to be completely transparent, I, along with pretty much everybody that's teaching this class, had to Google what the heck that meant because I was like, I don't even know what that means. Um, but it's really not that big a deal. It's, you know, how do X and Y change together? That's what it means. I don't know why we had to use fancy words, but you'll see that most of what we do today will be a review, okay? And um, so we're going to talk about functions. So a function, oh, handwriting. And don't be afraid to ask me what something says if you can't read my handwriting. And I realize, so because I'm changing notes from what I've kind of done in the past that I've sort of adapted as the years have gone on, these are kind of a whole lot of different. So I realize that the print is very small, but you do have it in front of you. Hopefully it's not too small for you to read. And I think some of the boxes or the lines are a little too small. So I apologize. I will pay better attention to that. Um, so a function, it's a mathematical relation because all functions are relations that maps. So that's a word that sometimes students are like, what? That means one thing goes to another. That's how they map things. Maps one set of input values to a set of output values. And each input value is mapped to exactly one output value. That's what makes it a function. Every input can only have one output. So our set of input values, the things that we put in, what we might think of as all of the possible x values, what do we call that thing? Starts with a D. Domain. So a set of input values of a function is called the domain. Now I referred to it as X just to kind of get your brain in the right spot there, but it's not always an X, right? So how else can we talk about it so it's we're not just saying it can only be this letter? How do we distinguish X and Y besides a domain? Starts with an I and a D. Independent, dependent. So is domain independent or dependent? Independent, because it's the one you're putting in, right? So the set of domain represented by the independent variable. Okay, this is literally Algebra 1 stuff, guys. Uh, so if this, if this sounds like you've never heard this before, we may have a problem. Um, the set of output values is called the what? Range, good. And that's represented by the dependent variable. Very good. And I understand if you weren't all screaming those out at first because you weren't sure the context or exactly what I was asking. But um, Okay. And with these new touch screens, uh, I accidentally write all over this stupid thing. All right. So now we're going to sketch this graph for x being between negative 4 and 4. So it has given me what we call a restricted domain. I don't want the entire function. I only want it from negative 4 to 4. And it says for the function rules below. It says the function f halves each input value and then adds one. So let's do some, let's do the ends of the domain. That helps. So negative four. If I substitute in a negative four and I take half of it, what do I get? Negative two. And then I add one. Where do I end up? Negative one. So I'm at negative four, negative one, right about there. So let's do the other end. Let's do a positive four. What's half of four? Two, you add one, you get three. So I also have the ordered, ordered pair four, three. And then let's just do one more easy one. Let's do zero. What's half of zero? Zero, you add one and you get one. Okay, so this looks like I could just connect it for it to be linear, right? Does it make sense for it to be linear? Because let's take what we're doing and make a little equation, right? You're gonna take half of the x value and then you add one. So that makes sense, right? My y-intercept is one and my slope is one half. 
there's my little equation. It didn't ask me for the equation, but you know, there you go. And so then I can connect those, sort of, pretend like it's straight. Should I put arrows on the end? No, because it was a restricted domain. Make sense? You good? All right. So let's go to this next one. I'm going to plot these points. So when x is negative 4, y is negative 1. When x is negative 1, y is 2. Sorry, i got to stand in front of it or I'm going to be way off. 0, 3. I think you can plot these without me. 2, 3, 4, 1. Now, do you think by the directions given and what I was given in B, do you think I need to connect those or no? Do you have enough information or instruction to connect them in any way? No. Now, if it said, using the table below, graph this parabola, right, then you would be able to plot some points. You know it's supposed to be a parabola, and it told you that you connect them, right? We don't even know if this is a continuous function. For all we know, this is just a set of data where five things happen, right? So this is it. Are both of these functions? They are. This is um, what this is finite data over there. And this is well, this is technically infinite, and that'll blow your mind a little bit. We'll get back there, but um, and discrete and non-discrete type of things. Okay, but so let's move on. What we're really talking about here is like how to write our domain and range type of stuff. So on example two, it says find the domain and range in each of the relations below, because again they're relations, and then we're gonna ooh, and then we're gonna determine, and then we're gonna determine if it's a function. So on A, we are given five points, kind of like we just were over there, right? And so I need to write my domain. Since it's a finite set of data, it's not a continuous type of thing, I have to make a set of data. And I need all of my x values. I want to put them in there from least to greatest, not the order that I see them. So this, what's my smallest x value? Negative 3. So I'm going to go negative 3, then 1, 2, Three and seven. Correct me if you think I'm wrong. Please never be afraid to question something. I'm definitely not perfect. I'm not going to say I mess up all the time, but but if I did do something incorrect, I need to fix it. If I didn't and you think I did, then I need to correct your thinking, and you need to be brave enough to say something so that I can help you. Otherwise, I can't help you. All right. And then range. What's my smallest y value? Negative four. So I get negative four. Then negative two, then two, no, wait. negative four, negative two. Oh, then five, I have two fives. Do I write it twice? No. And then six. All right. Everybody good with that? So now I have to determine whether or not it's a function. So I had two y values. Is it okay to have two y values? Yes, but it's not okay to have what? Two x values. And if you get that mixed up, right, because, you know, when you say you can only have one x value for every one y value or whatever, I mean, you can say things backwards, and I don't think that it's you don't understand. I think sometimes things come out wrong, or you're trying to figure out the wording, if it's tricking you, that sort of thing. Um, you can always think about, you can always draw yourself just a little basic picture that has really nothing to do with what this spe specific problem. So let's think about a parabola. In a parabola, this is the same y value. I have the same y value twice. That's totally okay because I know that that's a function, but I can't have the same x value. And then you can help, you know, wrap your mind around it and not get it backwards. All right, so then, yes, this is a function. All right, so then B for the domain. These, the x's, they're already in order for me. That's good. So negative 6, negative 3, 2, and 3. My range, that would be negative 4, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. Okay. Is this a function? I heard a yes and a no. Who wants to defend their answer either way? There's two negative twos, okay? Is that okay? There's two, wait, there's two negative twos? 
There's two positive twos, right? Okay. Oops, that's okay. <laughs> like, wait a minute. Um, so even though it's only, it's technically only in there once, right? But this x value has two different output values. And so if I was to list ordered pairs, then I would have two x's, and that's no bueno. The fact that there's two things that go to zero here, that's okay. But the fact that two branches off, that's bad. And so this is not a function. And notice I didn't just write yes or no. I wrote function and not a function because we have to be very specific with our answers. Okay. We good? All right, so the next part here. I could have just given you the graphs and we could talk about domain and range, but I decided that we were going to graph them together to do some review parts. So we're going to talk through some of this and talk about Maybe you could graph the whole thing on your own, maybe not, but what could you for sure get out of this? Because even if you look at something and you're like, I have no idea what that looks like or whatever, that doesn't mean that you can't do something. You with me? So some of this is just going to be us knocking some cobwebs off. The main goal here is to talk about domain. It just says domain, but we're going to do domain and range and whether or not it's a function. And um, But we're also going to do some of the graphing, which we'll get back to, but I'm just throwing that in here right now so we can kind of ease our way in. So when I look at A, for A, when you graph, when we graph that function, do you have a basic idea of what it's supposed to look like? What is this thing? What kind of equation is it? Let's say I. I heard it. Quadratic. It's a quadratic. And when you graph a quadratic, what does it look like? What do we call it? It starts with a P. It's a parabola. Right? So it's a quadratic, which means my parent function is this right here. Now that's not exactly what my graph's going to look like because clearly things are happening, but I know it's going to be a parabola. That helps a ton, right? So now we are going to see there's some things that we like about parabolas. Now we can put this in vertex form. We can do all kinds of things. We're just going to not worry about changing all the forms and do that because we don't always remember how we're supposed to do that. But we should know that usually with our parabolas, the zeros are important, right? Where it crosses the x-axis is a huge help with our parabolas. So I can find that by finding the roots, the solutions, the zeros, whatever. So if I set this equal to zero and I factor, so I factor out the x, that leaves me with x plus three. So my two factors are x and x plus three, which means my x values for my zeros are negative three and zero. All that sound familiar? So now I can come over here and I can say, all right, so at negative three and at zero, I cross the x-axis. That's a huge help. Now, is this parabola going to open up or down? Up, why? Because it's not negative, because it's positive or because it's not negative. Both of them are the same thing, good answers. Yeah, because it's positive, it opens up. If it was negative, it opens down, right? So I know it's going to open up, so I know it's going to look like this, right? But I also need to know, especially, now if I just was kind of sketching and just kind of cared about basically where it is, I could kind of sketch it in. But if I'm doing domain and range, I need to actually know where the vertex is, right? So we're just going to talk about what you would do. We're not actually going to do it because I don't want to take the time to go through the math. But uh, to find the vertex without putting it in vertex form or whatever, does negative b over 2a sound familiar? And we're doing that at some point. Okay. So we, if we did that, the vertex we would get, I'm just going to, we're just going to write the order pair down here. It is, because okay, so that's not, like I said, not really part of this lesson. We're just reviewing a little bit. Negative three halves. And that's what you would get from negative B over 2A. Then you substitute that in to find the Y value. And that becomes negative nine fourths. Okay. Now, whether those were written as fractions or decimals, Fractions are really, improper fractions are really the way to go. Again, I will make you a believer, I promise. You got to just trust me on some things. Um, but mixed numbers are definitely a no-go. Unless you are cooking in the kitchen and you need one and a half cups for something, that's the only reason you should use mixed numbers. Any other reason, they're in the trash. If they are given to you in a problem situation, you quickly change them to, to an improper fraction and move on with your life, okay? But don't ever take the time to put anything in, an in a mixed number because you're just going to have to take it right back out. All right. All right. So now we know where the vertex is. But even though I write it like this, right, because this is easier to use than decimals when you don't have a calculator. Again, I will make you a believer if you're not one. 
I need to think about what the decimal is or the mixed number so I can actually graph it, right? So negative 3 halves is like negative 1.5. Negative 9 fourths, what would that decimal be? Negative 2.25, because 4 goes into 9 twice with the one left over. 1 fourth is 0.25, right? So we're going to go to negative 1.5, negative 2.25, and, you know, you can't get real accurate on these tiny little graphs anyway. Kind of put it, what's more important is that we have the right number when we write the domain and range, not so much that our graph is perfect, but we've got that. So we can totally graph this entire parabola. Here's what it should look like. We, don't, we can put other points in there, but there's really no need for that. We've got enough. So then the domain. Now. There's different ways you can write the domain and range. There is set notation, which we kind of have to use if it's a finite set of data when we're listing them. There is inequality notation, which looks like this. And there is interval notation. Inequality notation is usually a hot mess because some of you still don't understand that the alligator eats the bigger number and what that means, okay? Um, or wh which way the signs go, and it's a freaking nightmare. You have been exposed to all of them, okay? Now, your teacher may have focused on one more than the other, but I am going to tell you, I will make you a believer. If, I can, if it doesn't happen today, it will happen. Interval notation is the way to go. It is the most logical for everything we do, because we're going to do way more than domain and range with this. So you've got to trust me. It's not all about domain and range, okay? Interval notation, that's the one with the parentheses and the brackets. And it's left to right, bottom to top. It's really hard to mess up. This gets messed up all the time. And it's just weird and gross. Okay, So we're going to focus on interval notation for sure. Meaning that, now, what you say and what the first thing you think of could be whatever, whether it's set notation, whatever. But then we have to make sure that we get it into interval notation. And I'll kind of show you as we go why it makes it a little bit easier. So how would you describe to me, in whichever, whatever way you want to say it, the domain of this function? Negative infinity to positive infinity. Was anybody else thinking anything different than that? All real numbers? Were you thinking that? Because that's what I hear a lot, which is fine. That's not what I'm going to write, because that's technically set notation. But it is all real numbers. So if you're thinking all real numbers, that's fine. But we're really going from, ne that means we're going from negative infinity to infinity. I start, we're going left to right. Way out here, I start at negative infinity, and I go all the way to positive infinity, right? Now I have to decide if this is opened or closed. Is infinity a number? No, because you can't count to infinity. What's two times infinity? Infinity, right? And the infinity plus one, it's infinity. Infinity plus two, it's infinity. And if you get into those theory classes, you're going to really make your brain hurt. So since it's not a number, your infinities never get included. Never you can't actually get there. Okay, we're good on that? All right, so then our range. Left to right, bottom to top, least to greatest every time. So as I'm coming up from the negative numbers, what's the first y value I get to? Negative 9 fourths, right? Is neg negative, not sorry, my pen is not. Negative 9 fourths. Do I include that or not? Yes, and if you question that, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to, you're, you ask yourself, is negative 9 fourths a y value that is physically on in my function? The answer is yes, so this becomes a bracket. Then once I hit negative 9 fourths, I keep going all the way to infinity, and then that's open. Interval notation, left to right, bottom to top. Once you get the hang of it, it trust me, it's going to make a whole lot more sense in everything. Okay, we good with that? Okay, so let's look at B. Now, on A, I feel like you should have known it was a parabola and what it looks like. Do any of you just know what B looks like? Probably not. I didn't know what B looked like until I graphed it. This is a rational function, and that's one kind of cool thing about rational functions, is most of the time you probably have no clue what it actually looks like in the end, but as you t graph what you know, the graph just kind of appears and it's just there. So, but there, even though we don't know exactly, I can't sketch a parent function out here, there are some things that we should know. So with um, parent functions, I'm sorry, not with parent functions, with rationals, this is where we started getting all those asymptotes, horizontal, vertical, um, oblique, whatnot. 
So with a horizontal asymptote, does anybody remember how you figure out where your horizontal asymptote is? Do you remember things like top heavy, bottom heavy, tight end degree? Does that at least sound familiar? Okay, should sound familiar because I know this is an algebra two thing. So this is bottom heavy because it got x squared in the bottom and x in the numerator, which means my asymptote is at y equals zero. So I'm going to put it in asymptote. Oops. I'm going to put it in asymptote with a dotted line at y equals zero. O n g. Y equals zero. I also could possibly have and do have vertical asymptotes. Anybody remember where where the information comes from from our ver for our vertical asymptote? The bottom, right? Because what can we not divide by? Zero, right? Look over here at these posters. We got n over zero. So if I divide by zero, it's undefined. O over K means OK, and you get zero. So I can't have zero in the denominator, right? It makes it undefined. So if my function is undefined at a specific X value, that's where my vertical asymptote comes in, right? Because I can't have any X's there. And so I need to look at my denominator. I'm going to take this, and I need to factor my denominator. So G of X is equal to, I still have X in the numerator, the denominator is a difference of squares. It is crazy easy to factor. When I, when I factor x squared minus 9, what do I get? x plus 3, x minus 3, exactly. And you know what? We're going to get difference of squares a lot, and that's great because it is so simple to do. All right, so that means that if I substitute in a 3, my denominator is going to be 0. And if I substitute in a negative 3, my denominator is going to be 0 which means my function is undefined when x is negative 3 and when x is 3. That's where my vertical asymptotes come in. So we're going to put a vertical asymptote at negative 3 and one at positive 3. So our vertical asymptotes come from the zeros of the denominator. One other thing that we can easily get from this is the zero of the function. Where does it cross the x-axis? Right? So that's um, when I do that, I set the numerator equal to zero. And if I set x equal to zero and solve it, I get x equals zero because there's nothing to solve. So a zero in the numerator would make, or a, z, a zero substituting in a zero would give me a zero in the numerator, a number in the denominator, which means my y value would be zero. So I know that this crosses the axis at zero, zero. Y'all agree with all that? At least follow me on that. That even if you wouldn't have thought to do all of that, that is stuff that happened in Algebra 2, okay? That is part of the Algebra 2 curriculum. Now, to get the rest of this function, we'd have to investigate a little bit more. And we're not going to do that just because of time, because I don't want to make your brain hurt too much. And this isn't a lesson on rationals anyway. But Again, that, that very basic stuff is something you should be able to get out of it, which maybe if this was a multiple choice question to, for a graph, if you knew that much, you might be able to pick your answer, right? Or at least narrow it down. So we're just going to sketch in the rest of it. I'm just going to tell you what the rest of it is. Looks like this. And I didn't know that by just looking at it. I had to go make a sign chart and do some other things, but sketch that graph in. And you may not have graphed rationals as complex as this, but the steps to get what we got were the same, regardless of what your, you know, your end result was. All right, everybody good at this point? So now let's talk domain and range. Interval notation here. So my domain, left to right, because it's the x's. I start way out here where? Negative infinity. And I know that my negative infinity Never gets a bracket. Then I'm going to go along, and I'm using all of these x's until I get to negative 3. I do not get to use negative 3 because it's a vertical asymptote. So I'm going from negative infinity to negative 3. Is this going to be opened or closed? Open. Because if it was closed, that means I get to 3, and I know that I don't get to 3. So open means I get as close as possible, but I don't actually make it. 
then since I have more to do, right, I have to write some more intervals and I have to union them together. So I use the union symbol, even though it's called the union symbol and it kind of looks like a U, it's not a U. So it doesn't have a tail on it, but it looks like this. Okay. So it kind of looks like a U without a tail, but it's, it's a symbol, it's not a letter. So I'm going to union that because then I start back over. Well, I start back over at negative 3, because basically I'm just jumping over that, negative 3, and I use all my x's until I get to positive 3, but neither one of them are included because there's asymptotes there, right? That makes sense? If I've lost you or you have a question, please speak up because you're probably not the only one thinking it. Maybe I need to re-say it or say it in a different way, okay? Because right now, it's all about notation. If your notation is not correct, it does not matter how smart you are. It does not matter how much you know. If you cannot communicate what you know correctly in writing accurately, then it doesn't matter, all right? And, that's, and I want you to get every point you possibly can on this test, and notation is huge. So then I start over again, so I have another union. I'm just jumping over the positive three, so that's open because I don't get to use that, and I go all the way to infinity. Any questions at all? Are we all good? Now remember, the overarching point of what we're doing right now is domain and range. I'm throwing in the graphing as a review for stuff that, because I know some of you would look at these and be like, I have no idea how to graph any of it. I want you to see that there are pieces you could get even if you couldn't complete the whole thing. That makes sense? Because I think a lot of times what happens is you see something like this and you're like, I don't remember what to do. I don't know what to do. And you just stop. Don't stop until you're actually stuck. You shouldn't have gotten stuck until we just had that one point there before we drew in the stuff, because I wouldn't expect you to be able to get the rest right now. But the other stuff should have, you know, should make sense. And you've got to learn to push through until you really are stuck. Because we think a couple steps ahead and we worry a couple of steps ahead. Don't worry and don't stop till you actually get to where you're really stuck. Okay, so C, what is this kind of function called? What is the symbol in the function? Square root, it's a square root function. Okay, so we did that little activity yesterday and we had a parent function on there, right? And we realized that our square root function is the inverse of what? Quadratic, so your quadratic looks like this. When you reflect it, you just get the top part of it, right? So your parent function looks like this. Knowing that is crazy helpful to graph this thing. And notice, we, I have not graphed anything by making a t-table and plugging in numbers. Yuck, no. Okay, that doesn't, no, just no. Um, so uh, we are going to look at some transformations here. Now I'm gonna do two steps where, if I was really doing this, I'd probably do one, and some of you might do one, but I don't wanna lose anybody. Not because you don't get it, but also I know you're looking down and writing and you look up and then you're like, where the heck did that come from? So I'm gonna flip this around in here and I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna say that this equals the square root of negative two x plus four. Do y'all agree that that's the same thing? Right. Okay, so in order for me to see my transformations, I have to factor out that negative two. So that means that this equals the square root of negative two, and then what would I have left inside? X minus two. So this is what, this is another form of H of X. It's the exact same thing, I just flipped it around and factored out. Didn't make anything up, didn't change anything values the same, okay? So let's talk about what these transformations do. This negative right here, if you're multiplying by a negative when you do transformation, what does that mean is happening to your graph? It's a, it's a flip. What's our, what's our official word for a flip? Reflection, good. So it's a reflection, and we have to decide if it's a reflection in x or a reflection in y. Which one do you think this is? x, reflection in x, okay. Uh, anybody think it's a reflection in Y? Okay. And remember this. Thank you for thank you for participating. Is it okay to be wrong? Yes. Is it okay not to be perfect? Yes. I model that for you every single day, and I don't even mean to. All right. So it's totally fine. I want you. I I, I need to know what you're thinking, and I want you to answer. And I'm never going to make you feel stupid. I promise. So let's think about this. If you're not sure, or even if you're confident, maybe you need to double check yourself. Okay, because most of you didn't answer. So I'm thinking most of you were not confident enough to actually say anything. If I have this point here, and I'm and I reflected, it, it ends up down here. Well, pretend like that's the same. 
that's bad, but just pretend like they're in the same spot. Um, so if I take this point and I reflect it down here, I have reflected across the x-axis, is that correct? Did my x value change? No, but the sign on the y value did, right? So if I reflect in the x-axis, the sign on the y value changes. If I reflect in the y-axis, the sign on the x-axis changes. And doing something as simple as this can help you wrap your mind around it, okay? So I want you to think about this negative. This negative affects the x because it's inside of here. So I'm changing the sign on my x value before I take the square root. So since I'm changing the sign on my x value, this is a reflection in what? Y. Does that make sense? And that's how you can make sure that you, that you get it straight. Okay? Not a bad thing to do. Didn't take long. Nobody has to know you're doing it. You don't have to erase it. It's fine. I like seeing things like that. That means you're listening to me and you're trying to figure things out correctly. So I know that my parent function looks like this, but it's going to be a reflection in y, so it's actually going to be pointing the other way, right? All right, so this 2, this is being multiplied. So that means it is a horizontal either stretch or compression. Tell me about x. What do we know about x in general in these? Is x a, does he tell the truth? No, x is a what? He's a liar, okay? So this looks like I should be multiplying by 2, right? But what do I really multiply by? 1 half. So it looks like a stretch, but it's really a compression because x is a liar, right? All right, and then so what does this 2 do? And this 2, not that one, this one. It, it's a horizontal, since it's x, it's a horizontal translation, right? Does this go to the right or the left? The right, because x is a liar and looks like it goes to the left, right? Y is a nice guy and he doesn't lie, but X is a liar and Y has never changed. All right, so that means we know all this thing, these things happen. That doesn't mean we have to do all these things to get our graph over here, but we're going to do some of them. I know that since I know that I have a horizontal translation, so I know that I'm moving to the right too. So where I was at 0, 0, I'm now going to be at 2, 0. Okay. Now, I know in general it's going to look like this, right? And I could use, oh, we're going to have to start here tomorrow. I didn't realize I was so close. Sorry, 